All right, hello, how y'all doing? Uh, this is Thread Brown, uh, pronouns him his, he. I am a uh, project manager uh, for the Freedom Project West, and I'm here with my brother, uh, Roderick, and we're going to share a couple of things in interview format. That way you can receive some of the constant information that we've gathered and collected. Uh, so brother Roderick, you can introduce yourself and we move forward. Yes, hello everyone. So I'm Roderick and I am a researcher with Freedom Project West and my pronouns are he, him, his. Okay, and so now that we got that out of the way, one of the things that we've done thus far with, the, um, with our research team is that we've narrowed down four findings into one specific topic that we wanna really generate our energy into uh, and share out the content with KCEN and other members of the Freedom Project and uh, other research and project managers that we have on this uh, brilliancy team uh, of people finding and collecting data content that support our arguments and support some of the things that we are in the process of manifesting into a reality to benefit us as a people, uh, but more so allow people to be transparent with policies and procedures that we have moving forward so that way is undeniably uh, acceptable from the content that we share. These are not just uh, personal experiences. These are personal experiences supported by uh, factual findings of things that hold uh, the system accountable. So in regards to what we've covered, uh, Brother Roger, if you can elaborate with us the basic concept of where we're going and what, what uh, avenue did we decide to choose to lead with? Yes, so we uh, came to a unanimous decision that, you know, Black dollar equals black power, uh, wealth literacy um, program for the Freedom Project in our attempt to identify uh, what the problems have been in the black community and all of the variations of social roles that have been happening in the black community, having a connection to the lack of economic advancement. And so we've been commissioned as researchers and project managers to simply identify what we know to be the problem Via our lived experience just growing up as people of color, black people in America. And so we understand clearly what the problem is in our community and what the problems have been in our community. And short, it's uh, economic disparity, which consequently uh, results in social, political uh, disparity and police brutality, uh, mass incarceration, and et cetera. A lot of other things that go on with it. And so I believe from my personal observation and from the collective observation of other people that if we were to properly address the economic element in regards to the black community and in that bringing about uh, economic opportunity, uh, we could correct a lot of our social problems uh, in our community. So, and that's okay. the, the basic outline. Okay, so in, in regards to some of the research if you share with me, and uh, a few other brothers that's on the research team and the project management team, you had pulled up some continent information that was stemmed from uh, law. I don't know if it was laws or policies that was back from the 19, uh, what I believe, 32? Mm -hmm, 33. Uh, 33. So if you can elaborate so away, we realized that a lot of things in our research is based off of uh, facts when we're dealing with systems. And so in regards to the system factual uh, uh, need for uh, content and data. Could you unpack that a little bit as far as that 1933 uh, content information that you found? Absolutely. So uh, prior to 1933 and leading up to 1933, you had Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma, which uh, basically was destroyed in 1921. And then eight years later in 1929, uh, you had the fall of the American stock market here in America. And at that particular period in time, um, there was a lot of unregulated practices happening within the American uh, economic engine, Wall Street. And so as a result of that dis, dis, uh, frivolous exchange of, sh of shares uh, that were being sold without any form of regulation, or whether or not the company who the shares are, uh, belong to had any type of real value or standing 
uh, was something that uh, was believed by the American government to have contributed to the collapse of uh, 1929, a lot of inflation and stuff like that going on. So fast forward into 1933, uh, where the Security uh, Exchange Commission enacted Regulation D to bring more uh, structure to the American uh, economic engine uh, and to uh, put other people in a, a better position at that particular point. So in 1933, under Regulation D, and I believe it's, it's the Section 501, uh, there was a mandate of accredited investor status. And so, in short, the standard for accredited investor status per policy is that at that time, you had to have a net worth of at least $1 million net worth, or you needed to have an average annual salary of $200,000 for three years consecutive. And if you met that economic threshold, then you were permitted to engage in economic activity that people who did not meet that economic threshold could engage in, such as the ownership and purchase of uh, private equity in companies before they went IPO. And that's a very significant stance in, in a stage to be able to acquire equity because at that point, acquiring equity in a private company before it goes IPO renders the investor exponential returns on their investment as opposed to post IPO where people are getting more so incremental returns on their investment. But taking it back, when that mandate of accredited investor status was enacted in 1933 under Regulation D, um, it excluded a lot of people of color because at that time, I mean, there just wasn't many people of color who were multimillionaire status and, and who might have been at that particular point. Uh, members from Black Wall Street were utterly bombed in 1921 prior to uh, 1933. And so because of that policy that was enacted in 1933 in the mandate uh, requisite for accredited investor status, that created a great economic disparity for the people, of, for, for the black community and for people of color in general, because we were not permitted to own equity in private companies before they went IPO. So therefore, we weren't allowed to make exponential returns on our investment at all. And so the rich had the opportunity to be able to engage in having pennies invested in shares in making dollars while those who were purchasing shares on the post ipo side had to pay dollars in order to make pennies and so this also created a great economic disparity in the black community and among those who were not considered accredited investors pursuant to regulation d and its mandate for accredited investor status and so this was one of the landmarks in American legislative history that served as a very, very great economic disparity for people, uh, generally speaking, who didn't have accredited investor status, and then more specifically for people who were Black, who, who pretty much they knew didn't have accredited investor status. And so we were locked out. And as a result of being locked out of true economic advancement, our community suffered. We didn't have the resources or the tools to be able to advance our schools or to advance any institution or industry that we intended uh, could help uh, further the progress of black people. We didn't have that opportunity. And so therefore our communities became progressively more weak as a result of having uh, a lack of economic uh, opportunity in this country. So that's okay. just the first portion. That's the history of legislation that brought about disparity. Okay, so now with that being a historical breakdown, of what we've experienced, why we're in the predicament that we're in, what is one thing in regards to policies or some type of law or some type of finding that puts us in a better predicament today if we had knowledge of that information? How could you outline that or present that to me if possible? Absolutely. So under the Obama administration, uh, President Obama looked in the history of legislation and not only the history of legislation, but the present stance and position of Black America and where we stand economically. And as a result of his observation, he saw and concluded that Regulation D uh, of 1933 was a great uh, disparity to Black people. And so 
In 2012, you begin the framework of enacting Re Regulation A. And then uh, in 2015, he came about with Regulation A+. Plus. And essentially what Regulation A and Regulation A plus represents is a deregulation of Regulation D of 1933. And so in other words, Obama eliminated the need for accredited investor status and opened up the element of crowdfunding and allowing for people who are uh, starting a business to be able to summon those around them, community members, peers, family, friends, whatever that may be, to be able to contribute to the jumpstart of our businesses. And so you didn't need to be an accredited investor in order to help uh, a colleague jumpstart a business. And so that's the acronym of JOBS Act, Jumpstart Our Business um, uh, Small Business Act of 2015, but the deregulation of Regulation D is essentially what Regulation A and Regulation A plus represents. And so this opens up the doors for people of color who were locked out since 1933. And if you ask me, uh, if you ask me, we were locked out of economic advancement even before then. But 1933 was that period. However, 2015, which happens to be 150 years exact from 1865, which was the alleged Emancipation Proclamation, so wherein people of color, black people, were uh, emancipated uh, physically. You know, after 310 years of chattel slavery, we were emancipated physically in 1865. But fast forward 150 years into the future, which is 2015, Black people were now emancipated fiscally. Because when a lot of us were on the plantations back in 1865 or prior to 1865, that's all we knew. That's all we ever understood was life on the plantation. We didn't know life outside of the plantation. We didn't know business outside of the plantation. In fact, we didn't know nothing other than what we were allowed to know because it was also American legislative policy that black people were forbidden to read, write, and learn. And if you were caught trying to read, write, and learn, then something happened to you, you know what I mean? So fast forward to right now, 2015 and 2020, uh, it's becoming increasingly and more apparent that without economic advancement in the black community, um, we will never be able to fix any problems going on. We will always be subject to other people's mercy and rather not they feel like helping us. And that's no stance for no living, self-respecting human being to be in where their life depends on rather not another person feels as if they want to help them. And so the stance that if you ask me as far as black people in 2020, like according to the records that I looked at just recently, the average salary of black persons is $18,000 on average. So that's not, that's when we include our exceptions like the Jay-Z's and the Oprah's and the Tyler Perry's or whatnot. But when you do a collective count and you do the division and the math on that, the average annual salary of a black family in America is $18,000. And then we have our Spanish brothers and sisters who actually have somewhere around about 19,500, somewhere above uh, what, what blacks are making. And then you have the average European, they're making $171,000 on an annual basis as a European family in America. And that's the average European. And then you have the top 1%. And according to an IRS audit in 2017, the IRS did an audit on the top 1%. And they discovered that the income of the top 1% starts, and I want to reemphasize it emphatically, starts at $531,372,000. That's where the top 1% salary starts. They account the, the 1% uh, reach in power and wealth accounts for over half the equity on Wall Street, which in turn accounts for $21 trillion. And if we want to get an idea what $21 trillion is like, well, in the CARES Act of March of 2020 this year, they authorized $2 trillion. And out of that $2 trillion, nearly everybody in America got a check for $1,200. So imagine what $21 trillion looks like. And imagine the fact that only 1% of the population is in possession of that type of money. So at the end of the day, God never intended for a small group of people to have everything while a whole lot of people have nothing. 
That was never the narrative that was intended. And so until there's social justice, then there will never be any social equity or equality. So as the script says, justice has fallen in the street and or equity has fallen in the street and justice stands afar off simply because truth has not entered into the situation. The truth of the matter is, is we're being robbed. It's just the straight out truth. And we're not in an economic, on a true economic playing field. Uh, and, and, and until we uh, take into account what has happened in regards to policy regulation A and regulation A plus, which serves as a solution to help black people to even the economic playing field and to close the wealth gap. And so last night I was listening to President Obama being interviewed on 60 Minutes. And when he was asked about the plight of black America, uh, he made it plain that there is a lot obviously going on in pretty much every statistical category, but one of the main ones is the judicial process and mass incarceration. And Obama said, well, there can't be any true reform to the judicial bias, right? Which obviously uh, sanctions people of color more so than anything. But he said there can't be any true reform to that until there's true reform to the corporate bias. And so rather people know it or not, America is ran by corporations. And in fact, America itself is a corporation. So until we get ourselves positioned economically as a people, there will be no justice on no level, period. On no level. Okay, so now <clears throat> nearing the closing of this, this interview, what would be one of our sole goals at this particular time? What do you see as a remedy or solution to our issue as a black people and those that are marginalized? How do you feel that our approach through our research and the agenda of where we're headed, what is our ultimate end goal? So our ultimate end goal, number one, is to change our condition as a people, that's number one, and to separate ourselves from the sanctions that we've been under. So to put it quite simply, black people need to divest ourselves from people who exploit us. And we need to reinvest ourselves in ourselves. Back during the time of chattel slavery, our people, black people, were used as profit and we were also used as collateral. And in fact, they preferred bankers and or lenders at that particular time and the slave masters at that particular time were able to take one of us and use us as collateral. In fact, the bankers preferred, quote unquote, slaves over property because slaves could be moved from state to state. So we were used, we were used as leverage, economic leverage for people who did not love us and for people who exploited us. We were used for profit and for economic leverage. So my conclusion, my theory is, is if we divest ourselves from those who have been exploiting us and then reinvest ourselves in ourselves and use each other for profit and for collateral, then we can gain an uh, economic stance in this country and subsequently change our social, political, and economic position in this country, and therefore not be subject to the brutality in the mass incarceration, in the mass unemployment, in the mass mental health crisis, in the mass drug abuse crisis, and all of the crises going on in Black America is more so the result of not only a spiritual uh, deficit, but an economic deficit. And so we need to create a school where people could be apprised of this new legislation that has taken place, and most importantly, the positive impact that this new legislation, Regulation A and Regulation A+, plus, that was enacted under President Obama in 2015. We need to be made aware of that. And not only that, we need to put into place an economic stratagem. That way, we can all be on a fast track to Wall Street. And we can all own equity in each other's startups. And when you get paid, we get paid. And when we all get paid, our community gets built. And when our community gets built, we get more wealthy, healthy, and, and, and more progress, more everything, more success, and more or less of the social woes that we were uh, experiencing prior to what we're getting ready to do. And I appreciate you a lot, brother, with all your information and the knowledge that you provided. And I could only hope that Casey and, and other uh, associated members of this research team, this brilliant research team, can 
uh, appreciate the findings that you've provided for us and the policies that back the legislative laws and things that you've compiled and brought to the table. I believe that this is a good start for us to have content and reputable information on the table, segueing us into this exit strategy of what we're doing for this research team. Uh, and if there's anything else that you would like to end in closing, feel free to share that before we press stop on the record button. Absolutely. So we just we covered more so predominantly the problem and the degree of what the solution is. But there's um, we will detail at you know if necessary uh, more what the solution is, which is like I said, divest and reinvest in ourselves or whatever. But then there's economic tools. There's digital tools that we need to get our hands on to be able to more effectively streamline the galvanization of Black people onto a singular financial platform. That way we can we can act as collateral for ourselves and for each other's uh, corporate uh, construction. With that, we'll be able to capture revenue more easily, more streamlined. We'll be able to capture revenue and value more streamlined, as well as corporate credentials, AKA or via credit of, of a corporation, which will put us in position to be able to acquire anything in the material realm to help our businesses that are failing because 40% of black businesses have failed in this pandemic. Right, because a lot of our uh, people don't have proper wealth literacy acumen. And so a lot of our businesses are based solely on revenue, meaning that if no one is coming to your door or whatnot, then you're not getting paid. And so we need businesses that are not only solely based on revenue, but are also based on the concept of capital gains. We need to put ourselves in position to be able to have more appreciation uh, activities going on where we're buying things at one cent or six cent like Mark Zuckerberg. He bought his shares on a stock option at six cent and when Facebook opened on the public market and went IPO, uh, it was around about $35 that it opened up. So imagine that percentage, that profit differential from six cents to $35. That's what you call capital gains. That's what black people have been locked out of. We more so waiting on a dollar, $20, $5, $100, a 50, you know, and that's been the base of our income stream. And then not to mention that's been a solo situation where we only have one stream of revenue as a business, as opposed to the Googles and the Apples and the Facebooks and the Snapchats, these people are on an acquisition spree, thereby creating a diversification of revenue streams. And so therefore, in a diversification of revenue streams, any seasoned or sophisticated broker or financial advisor would tell you that that is the number one guard against failure or against, or against volatility, is to have a multiplicity of revenue streams. And so there, all of this information needs to be taught to Black folks. We need a financial school where we can be apprised of what has now changed in regards to policy. And then we also need a digital product of which we have all the outlines of that that we can detail more later. But that's, that's my input. Thousands. I appreciate it very much, bro. Um, and uh, we'll send this out and we'll take it from there. Yes, sir.